Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Stephen's on this beautiful day for worship. Uh, my name is Reverend Chris Dowdswell, and uh, I'm really glad to be leading our service today. It's a blessing, and I have Travis and Lloyd here with me today. Lloyd on Lay Reader, Travis on Zoom. Very thankful for their help. Uh, James Sirwada Luaga and Ray Martinson have helped with our scripture readings today, and Michael Siebert has helped with our music selection and chanting. So without further ado, we are going to actually have a procession, procession with the cross today. I'm very glad to uh, renew that practice as we do in person. So great to have a lay reader here in person today. So uh, let us join together in our processional hymn. It is The Solid Rock, and the lyrics will be on your screen. Please join in our underline or our, sorry, our bolded portions of prayer. Lord, open our lips 
and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Please join in our hymn, Holy Lord. <clears throat> Please stand. Be seated for our first reading. A reading from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why do you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it. For the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa in Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, 
Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for today is Psalm 78. I invite you to sing along with Michael if you get the hang of the chanting. Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. seated for our second reading. A reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our gospel acclamation number 714 in your hymnal.
wilderness and gave them drink as from the great deep. Alleluia. 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 The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these? And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why don't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they, are all, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the, in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we read the first of three parables of the kingdom that Jesus tells back to back in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapters 21 and 22. Next week our lectionary calls for us to read the second, and the week after that to read the third. I want to look at these three as a unified section because they are written that way in the book of Matthew, but also because I think the way that Jesus relates to his audience through these three parables has much to teach us. To give you a little context, in the lead up to these parables, Jesus had just the day before made what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He rode into Jerusalem on an ass to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Zechariah. Then Jesus went straight to the temple, and he cast out the money changers and cleansed it, and the rest of the day he spent doing miracles. The blind and the lame, we are told, came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them all. 
These actions, the triumphal entry and the cleansing of the temple, were directly confrontational to the chief priest, and Jesus knew this. He was playing with fire. At the end of the day, he decided to leave Jerusalem and spend the night elsewhere. Perhaps he knew that the temperature was rising and he wasn't quite ready to get lynched. So he goes down the road a couple kilometers and he spends the night in the neighboring town of Bethany. The next morning, Jesus and his disciples get up and they begin to walk back to Jerusalem and they encounter a fig tree on the road or next to the road. Jesus, we are told, looks with great anticipation as he comes up to the fig tree, hoping that it bears some fruit. Perhaps the best Western that they stayed at the night before didn't include breakfast. But Jesus walks up to the fig tree, and lo and behold, he discovers that it has no fruit, only leaves. So Jesus says, fig tree, from this point on, you will not bear any fruit. And the fig tree withers. Kind of a strange little story. But Jesus uses this event to give the disciples a lesson in prayer. He says that if we have faith, whatever we ask will be given to us. We can command a fig tree to be withered. We can even cast a mountain into the sea, and it will be done. This image of the fig tree gives us a symbol of what is to come. A growing division between Jesus and his followers on one side and the temple hierarchy on the other. The mountain of authority in Jerusalem they were about to run directly into. Until this point, it seemed as though Jesus might be able to bring change to the temple. He had always welcomed the priests and the scribes to listen to his teachings. But it was also always clear that he expected a kind of change from them. To return to the sources of their faith. To welcome the stranger, the outsider the downtrodden, and the sinful. But it seemed increasingly that the temple powers were not going to repent, that they were just going to dig in their heels. So he encouraged his disciples that if it came down to a confrontation, that their faith in God would be able to cast this mountain of authority into the sea. And a confrontation there shortly was. The chief priests had been stewing all night over Jesus' actions the day before his triumphal entry, his cleansing of the temple, and how he had basically taken over the temple with people coming in to be healed. It goes without saying that the chief priests and the elders were ticked right off. Jesus comes into the temple that morning, and this is where our reading today begins. Jesus starts teaching his disciples, and the chief priests and the elders immediately interrupt him, saying, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? What they really meant was, who do you think you are, Jesus? You walk around here like you own the place, but this is our place, not yours. They were the ones that authorized everything that went on in the temple, and they certainly hadn't authorized him. Rather than getting into a fight, Jesus sidesteps their attack. He says this, I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things if you first answer me one question. By what authority did John baptize? Jesus was trying to trap them in their words as one last ditch effort to convince them to change their ways. And it worked at least for a time. The chief priests and the elders are taken aback. John was Jesus's cousin and he had been regarded by a prophet as a prophet by the people. So either they side with John, saying that John had God's authority, and by association affirm Jesus' authority, or they say that John only had authority given to him by man, and risk the people rising up against the temple. So they chicken out, and they respond, we don't know. Now this buys Jesus a little bit of time. Well, then I won't answer you either, he replies. And before they have their chance to collect themselves and attack him again, he starts into the first of the three parables about the kingdom. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And of course, the chief priests and the elders replied, 
the first. So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Jesus laid the smack down on them. But the graciousness of this smackdown is remarkable when you think about it. Jesus knew that the chief priests and the elders were there for a fight. And so we would expect that whatever Jesus would, Jesus would say would be condemning of them. But this first parable, while it is critical of their indecision about John, it still portrays them as brothers, as members of the same family. Now, I'm the father of two sons, and so this parable hit especially close to home for me. I had the exact ex or have the, had the ex exact experience of the father in that parable. I don't know how many times my boys have been sitting together on the couch playing video games or watching TV close to supper time, and something like the following has come out of my mouth. Okay, time to turn off the screens and do your chores. Graham, unload the dishwasher and Lucas set the table. Inevitably, Lucas will hear me and immediately respond, okay, just a minute, and then they will both proceed to continue staring at their screens. After a few minutes, I'll get a little impatient and I'll bark out again, Guys, time to turn off the screens and do your jobs. Then it's inevitable. It almost always goes down this way. Graham will get up and he'll start walking into the other room like he's starting to do his job. And I'm thinking, good, at least one is listening to me. And then he will walk into the kitchen and start playing with a toy or something that he left on the counter. Meanwhile, I'm in the living room, getting more impatient with Lucas, waiting for him to finish his game or his show. Oh, one more minute, he says again and again and again. But when Lucas finally does get up, he goes straight to the kitchen and gets to work. In fact, he works at it straight until the table is set. And he'll usually finish before Graham because he doesn't get as distracted. Now, just as in Jesus' parable, I'm more pleased with the child I think is doing what I've asked them to do. When Graham gets up before Lucas, I'm more pleased with him. And when, then when Lucas gets to work and finishes before Graham, I'm more pleased with him. But what really stands out to me about Jesus' parable, more than anything, is that Lucas and Graham are my sons who I love equally. Nothing they could do or say could make that me love them uh, any less. Whether they finish their job first or not doesn't change the fact that I love each of them 100%. And so when I hear this parable, I can't help but being struck by Jesus calling the chief priests and the elders brothers with the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Brothers who are equally loved, even if one is doing the Father's will and the other is not. Jesus tells them that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of them, not that they won't be admitted into the kingdom for their indecision, but that those who responded in faith to John will be admitted first. They will be given greater honor. But the other will still be there in the kingdom as well. In this first parable, we see Jesus doing everything he can to keep the chief priests and the elders from condemning him outright. He appeals to the best of their shared tradition, the repentance and social justice with John, which John proclaimed and which Jesus embodied in his miracles. And he appeals to their shared brotherhood with the tax collectors and prostitutes, trying his best to provoke just a little humility in them. And as long as the chief priests and the elders haven't yet made up their minds to stand in Jesus's way, Jesus seeks to meet them where they're at and continue teaching them. He continues to seek a godly evolution rather than a revolution. But stay tuned next week and the week after that to hear parables about those who stand in the way of the coming kingdom. Those parables will show us just what a godly revolution looks like. May God work in our hearts here today. May we continue to grow and evolve. Help us to move from our place of indecision to the following 
of John's repentance and Jesus' social justice. Give us faith to not only stand in front of the mountains, but to cast them into the sea. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Let us confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll now take our offering. We thank you so much for your generous tithes and offerings. Without them, we would not be able to continue proclaiming the good news of Christ in this time and place. And you can make your offering on our website through PayPal, through debit or credit, or you can uh, be in touch with our envelope secretary and receptionist, Carly, who can set you up with automated debit. Or you can just drop regular old checks off in our mailbox. We still do that. So thank you so much once again uh, for your gifts. Please join in our offertory hymn today. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Please stand.
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Please stand, sit, or kneel as you find most prayerful for our prayers of the people. Let us offer our prayers to the source of all love and all light, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh, merciful Lord, we pray for all who call themselves Christians, that we may become a royal priesthood, a holy nation to the praise of of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for the clergy and lay leaders as they, as they lead their congregation through alternative services during this pandemic. Lead them until we're able to gather again in, in our churches. We pray, Lord, for health and care workers and all who are providing essential services. And for, we pray for the support for members of our congregation as we adapt to the changes that we're facing. As Christians, all of we work for justice and reconciliation. That it may be grounded in scripture and in our common worship life. We need, Lord, with your help, to pray consistently for God's healing. For our healing in our lives and in our broken relationships between our indigenous brothers and sisters and newcomers to our society. Oh, Lord, in your mercy, hear Well, Lord, we pray for the most reverend Linda Carol Nichols, our primate. Indeed, for the reverend, the right reverend Greg Kerr Wilson, our metropolitan, and of course for the right reverend Rob Hardwick, our bishop here in the Diocese of Capel. Indeed, Lord, we pray that they and all ministers remain faithful to their calling and rightly proclaim the word of truth. We pray also, Lord, for our companion diocese and the bishops and clergy and congregations in, the, in Mainga and in West Malaysia and in Lichfi. We pray, Lord, for the clergy and lay leaders and congregations and the ministries of the parish of All Saints, Regina. We pray for the Council and Congregations of the North and for its Dean. We pray, Lord, for the, the region of the British Columbia Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Oh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nation and all in authority. We pray, Lord, for our Prime Minister, Justin. We pray for Lorne, our Premier. We pray for our MLA. 
pray for Jeremy, our member of parliament, for our mayor here in the city of Swift Current, for Dennis, and indeed all members of council. We pray, Lord, that they possess the spirit of wisdom and compassion, that there may be justice and peace in our land. When times are prosperous, lead us to thanksgiving, and when times are troubled, lead us to a deepening trust in you. We pray, O oh Lord, that all our all your people may lead quiet and peaceable lives. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for all of us in Swift and in our region and for all who live here. Pray indeed, Lord, for those who are for those who struggle. We pray for the poor and the rich, for the elderly and the young and for men and all women. We pray that for all who are struggling at this time, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will show your will to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for all victims in our society and those who minister to them. In the world, O oh Lord, we pray for an end of all violence. We pray, Lord, that, that our neighbors to the south may find solace and peace in their communities that struggle. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'll be their help and their defense. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who are preparing for baptism or for those recently baptized, that they may all be strengthened in their faith. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all the saints who have found favor in your sight. From earliest times, our prophets and our apostles, our martyrs and those whose names are known only to you alone. In this parish, O oh Lord, we pray for, of course, our rector, Reverend Chris and Reverend Krista Dowdswell and their family. We pray for all those who minister in our parish. We pray indeed, Lord, for all in our hospitals and special care homes and those who minister to their needs. And we pray for those who have asked for help, healing, or comfort. We pray for Donald and Amy, for Sammy and Terry. We pray, Lord, for Michael and Verona, for Agatha, for Karen and Laird. We pray, Lord, for Dora. And those known only to ourselves. O oh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, make us aware of your coming to us. Make us sensitive to your presence and alert to your call, that we may know that we dwell in you and you in us, that we may give ourselves to you in love and in service through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Grant, O most, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered by your Holy Spirit into one, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. I have a few brief announcements. If you are not on our email list and would like to be, please feel free to send our office uh, an email request to that effect. Uh, the following announcements went out on Friday, and uh, the first one is about small groups in the church. I just wanted to let everybody know that our vestry and our church board has been delayed in developing our official small group meeting protocols. Please continue not meeting until we are able to create and approve a set of protocols, and we will be distributing them in the uh, weekly newsletter on Friday as soon as possible. If you have a baptism uh, anniversary or wedding anniversary or a birthday, I'm sure you have one of those, if not more, uh, you are encouraged to let us know in the office so we can put you on our commemoration list. And this coming week, our commemorations are as follows. September 29th, we are celebrating Emily Beach and Laura Richards' baptisms. September 30th, Halen Oman's baptism. October 1st is Aaron Cashin's birthday and Mike Rogowski's birthday. And October 2nd is Leah Toulon's baptismal anniversary. So congratulations, all you guys. And uh, our final announcement, uh, we are both excited for Carly, but also a little grieving the fact that uh, she was offered full-time employment at Nutrien Ag Solutions uh, starting on Monday, tomorrow. So please join with us in offering her our sincere congratulations. She's only been part-time at the church, uh, but she has also graciously offered to stay on at the church a few hours a week to help us with some key duties. So she will continue helping us prepare our Sunday services and covering the envelope secretary duties. So she'll be working from home on Sunday afternoons and on Monday and Thursday evenings. I think she'll pop in on Thursday evenings to the church to do a couple things, but other than that, she will not be holding regular office hours. Uh, if you need to get a hold of her, you can feel free to email her or to call the office and leave a message, and she will continue to check those during her, uh, her work times. And once the pandemic ends, uh, we will be revisiting uh, what we would like, uh, what arrangement we would like in the secretary role. So, uh, but this this is a bit of a win-win situation, I think, for for both um, Carly and us for the time being. Um, but uh, yeah, if you need any help with anything that she's covering and overseeing, please feel free to email or phone the office. And that is all of our announcements for today. Please join in our recessional hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Please stand. Thank you. 
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Oh